Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of this wonderful program on radio, Education Today. Education Today is a program that aims to call attention of the public to education matters as they affect the effective running of the educational system and the achievement of educational goals. This comes on air every Saturday on this station, Lights Radio, between the hours of 3 o'clock and 4 p.m. West African time. I am Olubumi Kazim. Our goal with this program is to orientate inform and entertain the society on educational matters address issues affecting the running of the educational system and influence public opinion drive effective educational policy directions to guide the formulators and implementers for your comments questions and contributions you can uh, reach us on facebook via www.facebook.com forward slash lights radio www.facebook.com forward slash lights radio our twitter handle is at the lights radio instagram lights underscore radio youtube lights space radio you can also call or send a message to us via SMS or WhatsApp on 0809-738-4000. I'll take that again, 0809-738-4000. In order to reward those who listen and watch us live, you have an opportunity to win fantastic prizes on our short quiz segment. Listen on and watch out for the simple question. You never can tell. It could be your turn to win this week. We'll go on a quick break. When we return, the program continues. Please stay with us. Alright, if you just joined in, you are listening to Education Today on Lights Radio. We kick off with the news segment and we have Nima in the house to give us the news. Hello, Nima. Hello, good afternoon, Mr. Kazim. Alright, um, let's have the news. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the news on Education Today, reaching you live from Lights Radio. I am Nima Ibrahim. First, the headlines. Nikob Yuz, Funab Muslim students protest alleged bullying, victimization by management. Unilag bows to pressure, cuts down tuition fees. 300 private schools in Borno clo risk closure, says Commissioner. Unaccredited foreign varsities running satellite campuses in Nigeria, says NYSC. And on the foreign scene, Education Department works to rally support for Biden's Safe Students Loan Repayment Plan. And now the details. The Muslim Student Society of Nigeria, MSSN, Federal University of Agriculture, Abelkuta Funap branch has protested the alleged bullying and victimization by the school management against students wearing niqab. In the protest videos and pictures that went viral on social media, the students in their numbers took to the university's gates on Monday, carrying placards with different inscriptions to protest against the Development. According to them, it is beyond any justification for the school management to allow some students to roam almost naked around the school premises and have issues with Muslim students who are covering their bodies with the face veil. In a reaction, the authorities of the Federal University of Agriculture, Abel Kutsa Funab, have warned students of the institution not to disrupt academic activities following the protest on dress code policy. First, the institution, in a statement issued by its registrar, Dr. Bola Adekola, reiterated its dress code compliance for students and emphasizing the security implications of allowing individuals who cannot be facially identified on campus. Adekola, on behalf of the university management, also stated that the dress code has been in existence since 2017, saying that violators of the code would face sanctions in accordance with the extant rules and regulations of the university. 
The authorities of the University of Lagos, Junilaga Koka, have finally cut down its obligatory and some other fees being charged to the students. The university reduced the fees on Thursday evening following the marathon meeting that lasted for more than five hours with the leadership of the National Association of Nigerian Student Nans held at the institution. The meeting was at the instance of Unilag Management, who invited Nans leadership to jointly find an amicable resolution to the crisis and continue students' protests that trailed the fees increment since July. By this development, according to the university spokesperson, Mrs. Adejoke Alaga Ibrahim, the university has deducted 10,000 naira from the obligatory fees for new undergraduates and 20,000 naira from that of the returning students. Also, all students will now be paying 15,000 naira instead of 20,000 naira for utility, and the convocation fee will now be 27,000 naira instead of 30,000 naira. Recall that earlier in the week, the police command in Lagos State had deployed its men to the Unilag as students protested against an increase in their school fees. More than 300 private schools in Borno risk being shot for failure to participate in government mandatory accreditation. Commissioner for Education Lawan Wakibe told reporters in Maitu Kuri yesterday that the exercise became necessary to contain the proliferation and unwholesome activities of some private schools. He said it was of concern that since the exercise began in 2022, only 266 private schools had complied out of about 600 of them. Wakibe also said the ministry of private schools proprietors, the Ministry of Justice and the police would meet on Saturday to warn about the illegality of operating on accredited schools. He added that the meeting therefore would also warn about the possibility of shutting defaulting schools and prosecution of the proprietors. The National Youth Service Corps, NYSC, on Tuesday said unaccredited foreign universities were still running satellite campuses in Nigeria. This is despite government efforts at ensuring that the menace is completely eradicated as graduates from such schools are not eligible for the compulsory one-year national service. The scheme's director general, Brigadier General Yushal Ahmed, made the disclosure at the 2023 annual meeting of professional and regulatory bodies having operational links with the scheme. While commanding the Nigerian Universities Commission's continued efforts in publishing names of unaccredited institutions, he said this, however, has not eradicated the activities of agents running satellite campuses and awarding certificates to foreign schools in Nigeria. In view of this, the DG who spoke through the director ICT, Mrs. Christy Uba, said it would continue to engage other critical stakeholders to ensure that unqualified graduates are not allowed into its mobilization process. And in conclusion, representatives of the National Universities Commission, NUC, Joint Admissions and Matriculation Board, JAM, and National Board for Technical Education, NBTE, in the separate goodwill messages, commended the mobilization process of NYSC and pledged more support to ensure seamless mobilization process. And on the foreign scene, the Department of Education is putting a marketing campaign for its new income-driven student loan repayment plan into overdrive and mounting criticism from the right and some on the left. Department officials announced Tuesday that they're partnering with more than 100 organizations across the country to get the word out about the administration's saving on a valuable education or SAVE plan. It's the most affordable repayment plan ever, Education Secretary Miguel Cardona said on a call with reporters. More than 4 million borrowers have already enrolled in the plan and another million have applied. The, the plan is set to cap accruing interest for borrowers who stay on top of their payments and broadly decreases monthly payments. Thus, Africans making less than $15 and her won't have to make any payments at all according to the department. That's all on the news for today, but before we go, a quick recap of the major stories. Nikob Yus, Funab Muslim students protest alleged bullying victimization by management. Junilag bows to pressure, cuts down on tuition fees. Unaccredited foreign varsities running satellite campuses in Nigeria, says NYSC. And on the foreign scene, Education Department works to rally support for Biden's Save Student Loan Repayment Plan. 
that's the news. It was compiled by Nima Ibrahim and edited by Lubumi Kazim. Don't forget for the coverage of your educational programs, seminars, events, competitions, trainings, among others, you can call us on 0702-507-4268 or you can send us an email via educationmediaservices at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs> All right, that's all we can take on the news uh, for today. Right now, we'll take the icon of, of the week. Hey, welcome to the icon of the week segment where we consider the life and times of individuals that lived inspiring lives and contributed immensely to educational development in the world. I am Ulubumi Kazim. Our icon for this week is Chief Akintola Williams. Chief Akintola Williams was a Nigerian accountant and the first Nigerian to qualify as a chartered accountant. Akintola Williams was born 9th August 1919. His grandfather, Z.A. Williams, was a merchant prince from Abelkota, and his father, Thomas Ekundaya Williams, was a clerk in the colonial office who set up a legal practice in Lagos after training in London, England. He was the older brother of Frederick Rutimi Williams, who later became a distinguished lawyer, and the late Reverend James Kennedy Williams, a Christian minister. For his primary education in the early 1930s, uh, Kentola Williams attended Olugu Methodist Primary School, Lagos. Williams then attended the CMS Grammar School, Lagos. He went on to Yaba Higher College on a UAC scholarship, obtaining diploma in commerce. In 1944, he traveled to England where he studied at the University of London. Studying banking and finance, he graduated in 1946 with a Bachelor of Commerce. He continued his studies and qualified as a chartered accountant in England in 1949 the first Nigerian to achieve such feat. A Yoruba of chiefly background, the Oloye Williams was one of the founders of Egbe Omo Dudua Society while in London, with Dr. Onya Kirili as president and chief of Bafim Aulaw as secretary. After returning to Nigeria in 1950, Williams served with the Inland Revenue Service as an assessment officer until March 1952 when he left the civil service and founded Akintola Williams & Co. in Lagos, the first indigenous accounting company. The company was the first uh, accounting, uh, indigenous accounting firm in Africa, not just Nigeria. At the, at the time, the accounting business was dominated by five large foreign firms. Although there were a few small local firms, they were certified rather than chartered accountants. Williams gained business from indigenous companies, including Nandi Azikwe's West African Pilot, K. Umbadiwe's African Insurance Company, Fireman Furniture, and Ujuku Transport. He also provided services to the new state-owned corporations, including the Electricity Corporation of Nigeria, ECN, the Western Nigerian Development Corporation, the Eastern Nigerian Development Corporation, and the Nigerian Railway Corporation, as well as the Nigerian Ports Authority. The first partner in the firm, Charles Sankey, was appointed in 1957, followed by the Cameroonian Mr. Injo Litumbe. Litumbe opened branch offices in Port Harcourt and Enugu and later spearheaded overseas expansion. In 1964, a branch was opened in the Cameroons, followed by branches in Cote d'Ivoire and Swaziland, and affiliates in Ghana, Egypt, and Kenya. By March 1992, the company had 19 partners and 535 staff. Demand grew as a result of companies, the Companies, and Ally, companies Act of 1968, which required that companies operating in Nigeria formed locally incorporated subsidiaries and published audited annual accounts. The drive in the early 1970s to encourage indigenous ownership of businesses also increased demand. In 1973, AU Consultants uh, Limited, a management consultancy headed by Chief Arthur Banifu, was spun off. The company acquired a computer service company and a secretarial service, and in 1977, the company entered into an agreement with Tush Ross International based on profit sharing. Williams was also a board member and major shareholder in a number of other companies. He retired in 1983. 
Between April 1999 and May 2004, Akintola Williams & Co. merged with two other accounting firms to create Akintola Williams Deloitte, now known as Deloitte & Touche, the largest professional services firm in Nigeria with a staff of over 600. In terms of public roles and honors, Williams played a leading role in establishing the Association of Accountants in Nigeria in 1960 with the, glo with the goal of training accountants. He was the first president of the association. He was a founding member and first president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. He was also involved in establishing the Nigerian Stock Exchange. He remained actively involved with these organizations into his old age. At a stock exchange ceremony in May 2011, he called on operators to protect the market and ensure there was no scandal. He said that if needed, market operators should not hesitate to seek his advice on resolving any problem. Public sector positions held by Akintola Williams include Chairman of Federal Income Tax Appeal Commissioners between 1958 and 1968, Member of the Coca Commission of Inquiry into the Strategic Corporations of the former Western Region of Nigeria in 1962, Member of the Board of Trustees of the Commonwealth Foundation between 1966 and 1975, Chairman of the Legal State Government Revenue Collection Panel 1973, and chairman of the Public Service Review Panel to correct the anomalies in the Udoji Salary Review Commission in 1975. Other positions include president of the Metropolitan Club in Victoria Island, Lagos, founder and council member of the Nigerian Conservation Foundation, NCF, and founder and chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Musical Society of Nigeria, Muson. In 1982, Williams was honored by the Nigerian government with the Officer of the Federal Republic, Following his retirement in 1983, Williams threw himself into a project to establish a musical center and concert hall for the Music Society of Nigeria. In April 1997, Williams was appointed a commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire for services to the accountancy profession and for promotion of arts, culture, and music through the Musical Society of Nigeria. The Akintala Williams Arboretum at the Nigerian Conservation Foundation headquarters in Lagos is named in his honor. On May 8, 2011, the Nigerian British Association presented an award to John Kufo, past president of Ghana, and to Akintola Williams for their contributions to democracy and development in Africa. Chief Williams turned 100 in August 2019 and died on 11 September, just four days ago, in 2023, at the age of 104 in his Lagos home. That's all on the Icon of the Week segment. Our education today continues. Please stay with us. All right, that was the icon of the week. We celebrate the doyen of accounting and first chartered accountant in Nigeria, Pa Akintola Williams. Right now, we'll take this school in focus. Good afternoon, welcome to the School in Focus segment. We'll take a look at institutions of interest, provide a background to their establishment, their administration, and some notable alumni. I am Olubu Mikezim once more. Our maiden school for, uh, well, um, our school in focus for today is the prestigious Yaba College of Technology established by the colonial government of Nigeria in 1947. Yaba College of Technology started as Yaba Technical Institute, which took over all the activities and assets of Yaba Higher College following the recommendation of the Elliott Commission on Higher Education in West Africa. The Yaba Higher College was closed down and the students were moved to form the nucleus of the University College Ibadan in 1948. The nation's first technical institute, Yaba Technical Institute, started day and evening classes in October 1947. On September, September 23, 1963, Right Honorable Dr. Nnamdi the then Governor General of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, renamed the Yaba Technical Institute as Yaba College of Technology on the occasion of the official opening of the engineering block donated by Shell British Petroleum. The change in name was in anticipation of the dynamic role of the the college was to play in the production of technical manpower for the economic and social development of Nigeria. In the words of Dr. Azikwe, Yaba College of Technology is at the forefront of the overall program for streamlining our technical education to meet the needs of Nigeria. This change of name became a catalyst that threw off the need for autonomy for the college. Thus, the first step taken was the construction of an advisory board in 1964 by the Minister of Education to help the college in its challenging path to the future. 
The quest for autonomy for the college finally came to a head in 1969 with the approval of the autonomy and the promulgation of the Decree 23 of 1969, Yaba College of Technology Decree 1969, which granted it the mandate to provide full-time and part-time courses of instruction and training in technology, applied science, commerce and management, and cultural production and distribution, and for research. This decree represented a major step towards the development of the college. It is significant to note that Yaba College of Technology was the only college offering higher diploma courses in Nigeria till 1979 when the Federal Polytechnics Act 1979 was promulgated. The name was changed to Federal Polytechnic Yaba in 1979 but reversed to the current one that is the Yaba College of Technology in 1980. The college is the first institution in Nigeria to establish a center for entrepreneurship development with linkages with the world of commerce and industry. The center offers compulsory courses which must be taken by all students throughout their stay in the college. The college has won the Nigerian Polytechnic Games Association five times out of 16 editions of the competition. The college also has a second campus at Ekbe, which is home to the Department of Agri Agricultural Technology, Agri and Bioengineering, Leisure and Tourism, School of Technical Education and Michael Otedela College, Michael Otedela Information and Communication Center. Yaba College of Technology has in all eight schools and 34 academic departments with a total of 70 accredited programs across the national diploma, higher national diploma and post HND levels. The college also offers certificate courses. Apart from this, the college offers BSc education courses in technical and vocational education, postgraduate diplomas in engineering, urban and regional planning. The programs are run in conjunction with the University of Nigeria, Onsuke, and the Federal University of Technology, Akure. The student population, which is made up of both full-time and part-time students, is in the range of 15,000 and 16,000, while the staff strength is 2,063. In April 2015, the National Board for Technical Education approved five new courses for Yaba College of Technology. These are HND in mass communication, banking and finance, metallurgy, engineering, national diploma in welding and fabrication, and public administration. In June 2019, Heber College of Technology made the move to partner with a leading Nigerian security solutions company to design and implement a security management certification program. The program targets individuals who desire to be modern security managers and those in active security employment or planning to venture into the security industry from managerial levels. The college also has a functioning radio station, YCT Radio 89.3 FM. The radio station was established to serve as a training ground for mass communication students and future broadcasters to serve the Yabatech community and its neighboring communities through local program development, exposition of local talent, music, news, weather, and market information, as well as giving voice to the populace. In addition, it serves as a training ground, like I said earlier, for the production of mass communication students. The college is currently headed by Dr. Engineer Ibrahim Adida Tun Abdul, the rector. He succeeded Engineer Obafe Memokungwe on May 16, 2023, who completed his tenure in January 2023. The over 70 year old institution has been headed by a number of indigenous principals and rectors, including the founding principal, Dr. E. Akindele, who was the principal between 1970 and 1975, Mr. G. M. Okufi, the first rector between 1975 and 1985, Dr. Philip Adegbili, rector 1985 to 1993. And Mrs. F. Dugbeson, Rector 1993 to 2001, Mr. Lubumi Washer, Rector 2009 to 2001 to 2009, and Dr. Mrs. M. K. Ladepo, Rector 2009 to 2017, followed by the immediate past Rector Engineer Bafeme Wosheni Omokungwe, who was a Rector between 2018 and January 2023. And the incumbent Rector succeeded uh, him and became the Substantive Rector uh, in May 2023. Some of the notable alumni of the college uh, include visual artist Ulushe Adejumo, a cartoonist J Josie Ad Ajiboye, an entrepreneur, commodity, trainer, commodity trader, and CEO Ayode Jibalogun, actress Omotola Jalade Ekeinde, economist Benga Ibikunle, actress and film producer Ruth Kadiri, dancer Kathy, uh, actor, director, and producer Jide Kusoko, as well as Tim Uwoferi a politician among other alumni. That's it on our School in Focus today. I hope you learned one or two things about Yaba College of Technology. And in case you are interested in, go on the website, go on Google, search for Yaba College of Technology, and you'll see a lot of other information about the school on its website. I remain Ulu Mikazim. Education Today continues in a moment. Please stay with us. <music>
to education today on light radio and we are moving into the discuss segment already our guest is here with us and we shall be taking a look at age requirement for university admission relevant or outlandish we know quite well that before now um the joint admissions and matriculations board jam has a, an age specification for any student that is aiming to um that is seeking admission into tertiary institutions in Nigeria. Um, according to Jam, the idea is to ensure probably some of these students mature or probably there could be other reasons and it is expected that all tertiary institutions in Nigeria would follow this particular rule. So today we know that a lot of um, students and parents try to, you know, outsmart uh, the jam and these institutions by adjusting the age of their children just to ensure that they gain admission we have a lot of probably some of these children that finish uh, before the age of 16 they finish secondary school before the age of 16 and they already apply for um admission uh, into the tertiary institutions in nigeria now for these students uh, a lot of them for those probably that are caught they are unable to register because they are declined the admission because of age while some will probably you know try as much as possible not to use their birth certificate and probably come up with uh, some other ideas like use of um declaration uh, an affidavit where they actually swear uh, do a declaration of their age and claim a particular age that would qualify them for admission so um and that's what we want to look at today age requirement for um university admission relevant or outlandish and joining us uh this evening to discuss this topic is a lecturer in the department of adult education at university of lagos uh mrs anike odusoya good afternoon madam and welcome to the program oh good afternoon thank uh, you so much for having me today all right Thank you very much. So to our listeners, you can be part of this discourse by sending your comments and questions to 0809 I'll take that again. 0809 
738 or drop your comments via the live video feed on facebook and youtube but just before we go into the discourse proper a short quiz question for this week in what year did chief akintola williams become a chartered accountant in what year did chief akintola williams become a chartered accountant send your answer to the whatsapp number 0809 or our facebook or youtube page the first correct answer uh, like you know wins the prize all right so uh moving into the discourse uh proper um so uh mrs odusa let me start uh this way uh well let me even probably even start on a lighter note at least for the fact that we know university of lagos we read in the news that university of lagos eventually um you know agreed to cut down on uh the fees uh payable by the students so um how do you receive this information probably before we go there let me just um you know hear your own side of it how do you feel with um, that announcement it, about, at least about twenty thousand naira has been removed from the amount payable by the students and for the hostel fees it was reduced from ninety thousand to forty three thousand so how do you welcome this for the fact that you relate with students especially some of these young adults that probably uh, you know have gained admission to the universities how do you feel with this news Uh, well, personally, I see it as a, a very well thought initiative. It was well thought because I had already thought that uh, perhaps we are in the military era because over time the students have been held to do a lot of riot and to do a lot of um, expressions here and there over the social media, even physically they were on campus. So they came in a lot of times, but eventually I'm, I'm very, very happy that eventually it came out at least successful in a way, if not that much, but at least in some way they gave a listening here to them and they were able to remove, if not little, from the huge fee. So that's a good one. All right. So now going to the topic of discussion, because we are looking at age requirements. So let me ask, what exactly is the age requirement for admission into universities in Nigeria? Okay. So I'm saying... Oh. Okay, we seem to be having some network issues there. Uh, sorry, I think we lost you in the. Sorry, Madam, Mrs. Odusaya. Uh, we lost you in the middle okay. there because uh, through the network, the network, you know, behaved in a funny way. So, uh, the question exactly is what is the age requirement for admission into universities in Nigeria? The age requirement is 16 years. 16 years. Six, 16, 16 years. years. One six. 16 Did you years. get that? Yes, yes, yes. So that means years. for yes. a child, uh, is there a particular point? Because we know that it's not everybody that will arrive at 16 years old at the same time. Some probably will clock 16 at January. Some will clock 16 in December. Some probably in the middle in June. So at what point exactly are we looking at now? That's 16 years. Uh, that's 16 years. Is at that that session exactly that session of uh entry? The session Probably, of entry. okay. Let's say the registration, yes. Let's say the registration is supposed to be for May, so uh, the student uh is gonna clock 16 probably by May, that's still acceptable, or in that particular year of entry, okay. All right, um, yeah, so probably can you let us into the wisdom behind this age requirement? Is there any reason behind, uh, you know, pegging that age as probably the minimum age any student would, uh, you know, must get to before he or she gains admission to the university? Oh, well, <laughs> that question is kind of tricky, but I'll try uh, in my own possible way to do justice to it. Okay. Well, I wasn't among the committee that, that brought about that age requirement. But in Nigeria, we have... a. Uh, uh intellectuals we have people that are knowledgeable we have professors we have people that are lawyers that are uh, senior advocates we have a lot of professionals we have child experts so i'm sure this set of people must have been put together as a committee to set up the related requirements so but well just as we know in this part of uh the world where we are we we usually don't embrace uh, our own so uh, i'll see it as though we don't believe in our intellectuals if we query that age but so to say 
uh, I'm sure these are intellectuals that must have been put together to right. come about this. These are child attacks. People that know that this is the particular age that is suitable for this kind of entry. So okay. they are body of intellectual. Okay. Because I'm trying to look at it from this angle that you know, as an educational manager, okay. I'm looking at the structure of Nigerian educational system. You, uh, which child supposed to spend six years in primary school and six years in secondary school. And ordinarily, probably you look at it that a child would probably gain entrance, you know, enroll into primary one probably at the age of six years. So if you add six years plus, okay. uh, you know, plus, um, so six years in primary school with the age of entry, it means like at most probably the child will probably be uh, graduating from primary school at 11. And uh, probably if you add another six years to it, probably that will be 17. Now, let us now probably even imagine plus or minus some, you know, children probably start a, a bit earlier. Then it means that at least by 16 years, they must have clocked 16 years by the time they finish secondary school. Probably that was the idea. I don't know. Like you said, you said you don't know. Yes. And I don't want to probably, you know, um, just uh, <laughs> uh, uh, pontificate on why. Now, uh, let me ask now, as, you know, an adult education expert, probably, is there any correlation, any relationship between age requirements and intellectual capacity of the students? Well, to answer that question, uh, as an adult educator, just like you said, and uh, as an educationist in general, uh, I've been uh, I've been taught, and I'm still learning that uh, we have different categories. So it has no correlation with age, actually. So to say, because we have very intelligent students. And we have children that have very low high care. So these categories of students put together make up a class. That's nothing to do with age. Okay. Did you get that? All right, good. So no, but does it have anything probably to do with maturity then? Probably to do with age. And that, that, what I'm trying to say is uh, a, a child who is uh, very high in high IQ, more than a child who is even 13. Okay. So it has nothing to do with age actually. But then, there and then, when we talk about pegging that uh, entry into university for 16, we are looking at all, not just the IQ. We are looking at other factors put together. We are looking at the social life. We are looking at um, the, the adversity quotient, how a child can be able to make, uh, uh, adjust to probably failure, how a child can be able to adjust to bullying, so to say, and a lot of other things put so psychological maturity uh, are the things that were considered before yes yes these are also other factors put together so we are not just looking at the intellectual capacity of the child or the student per se we are looking at other things because i know all quite because together. i know the quite well that a lot of parents will claim that after all this child is very brilliant he's you know getting a's and <laughs> things like that so you're saying it's not just about a question of their intellectual mm -hmm. capacity yeah yeah. But also their resilience, mm -hmm. ability to the withstand um, challenges, rigors, and the likes like that. Yes. But ordinarily, pressure. you would expect pressure yes. that you would expect in the university at that level, and that the child should be able to cope yes. some of these pressures. Yes. All right. Now, is this yes. a Nigerian practice or a global phenomenon that probably okay, um, the age requirement before you probably gain admission to university is it a Nigerian thing? Or that we just that we just came up with here in Nigeria because we are trying to make sure the children of the poor people, you know, don't get at gain admission quickly, so that the children of the rich can travel abroad and quickly gain an education and become masters. Because I'm trying to talk about some of the mentality that we, you know, the, that some of the experience out there that you share. So is this a Nigerian thing oh. or it's a global phenomenon that that should be age requirement for entry into, um, you know, um, tertiary institutions? No, 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 no. This is a global practice. Uh, just like I said earlier, uh, when we first started that, uh, the committee that brought about that age requirement, they are intellectuals, they, must, they, have, they have traveled far and wide. They are people that have looked at how it is being done else. So practice in the US is five years before it. In, in Germany, in all other, this is how it is being done. So if we want us to be, uh, as good as this why can't we just look at the way it's been done and it's working for them why can't we do it there uh, the same way as well so it's a global practice it's not only obtainable in nigeria it's obtainable in other countries too so you're saying for instance probably a child that is not yet up to, um, that is not up to 16 might not gain admission in the u.s yes okay 
Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. I hope, you know, I'm saying this so that you can retrace it. So it's not just as if you are just presenting some of these things. Because I probably know in some countries, probably it's even 18 years before you can get admission into probably universities and things like that. Yes. Now, if I may ask you, what do yes. you think is responsible for this quest for underage admission? Why are parents probably in the rush for their children to quickly gain admission to the university? Are probably these, um, you know, underage, um, you know, category. So, and probably who should we blame for this act? The parents or the students themselves? It's the parents. The student has nothing to do with this. It. It's the parents. Okay. They, 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 they are the one that have been blessed with this set of students that the one that has been blessed with those children and they are in the best position to make decisions for them so they, they've not reached the age to stand alone and make decisions for themselves okay many times many times so yeah. at such stage is the parents is the parents and why do parents now do them. that why do parents do it what exactly is um, it that they are after why are they in that rush do you have an idea parents do this uh well uh, the first thing is uh, comparison let me put it that way they tend to compare that oh okay my neighbor's child is nine he's already in G uh, gs2 so why shouldn't my own child i stand also be in uh gs3 they tend to compare they tend to want to go through the back door they they don't want to like follow the rule they don't want to follow the law they don't want to follow the norm they don't want to follow the, the acceptable practices they just want to go through the back door just like i told you here in this part of the world we, we try to always go through the back door we want fast track even the youth of today they want fast money fast and that's where we see don't let us put other topics into it but it's just a thing of parents oh parents, 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 parents. They want my fast own thing. child they is here. already they say, oh, yes yes yes, yes. Mm, wow all right yeah i Let, think that's the problem we are having okay does that probably also have anything to do probably with this idea of employment so it will be a case of uh you know probably someone that is graduating at 21 and you are saying that oh minimum also so at this particular age with also number of years of experience so do you think that also contributes to this quest for people you know to quickly graduate from school and gain admission early and graduate early so that they have enough years probably for jobs or things like that or that they can meet up with um, you know the labor market requirement in terms of age well uh it shouldn't it shouldn't naturally naturally it shouldn't because these employers of labor themselves they are well aware of the fact that this is the age requirement this is the particular age that uh, such students will graduate so if from the from the roots the problem has been has been fixed we won't have the case of of uh, employers of labor looking for far below the age requirement probably they are looking for a 19 year old to occupy a position but then and then this could also be a factor so to say but then we really need to stand for this it's the best for us it's the best okay now all right it needs to be corrected good now but um i want us to look at this uh, we've seen um you know some specially gifted students who are younger and have performed well in their SSE, in their UTME, and they are denied admission because of age. Should this be, or we should have allowed such special circumstances and grant such students, you know, special students, in, you know, what we call probably concessionary admission on the basis of their special gifts? Okay. Well, this uh, question, I'll just put it as, in my own opinion okay like in that. my own opinion if i have a gifted child a gifted student i will follow the rule but in the meantime i will engage that child when i say engage that child for that period of one year it won't even happen in the first instance because i'll follow the rule i'll follow the norm which is the usual 16 because i would have followed it all from primary school but then let's assume that okay i find myself in that circle mm -hmm. I will engage the child for the period of that one year. Oh, rather than probably I'm, I'm, appeal, I'm, rather than appeal to the university yes, for concessionary yes, admission yes. for that child. No, I won't do that. No, wow. I will engage that child such that for that period of one year, for that period of one year, the child will look at me and say, "Wow, well, no." Thank you, mom. You've done well for me. <laughs> All right, I like that. I like that. I like it. Well, like to you know, you have put um, the caveat 
for you and this probably is what you would do so but for so many people because i know quite well that university authorities have usually been put under a lot of pressure that why can't they you know grant that special status because we have a specially gifted child and we probably should just um, you know give concessionary thing after all we have someone probably they will give examples of someone they say yeah this particular person because of the special gift and very high iq became a professor at the age of 19 and things like that so that at what age and uh -huh. so you have a specially gifted eight year old girl that is serving um the university ma the university mathematics so why can't we allow such a child to just go like that because of the special nature of that child so if you were to advise the university authority what would you say in such situations actually they would take their stand wow the, the university the should take its stand their stand wow. this is the law this is the rule this is how we do it here we don't shift grounds here when are it comes there to are there aren't there exceptions to every yes. rule yes aren't there, there exceptions, are exceptions to rules but but we are talking about human beings here. We are talking about our future leaders. We are talking about our tomorrow. Uh, let it cut across all. Don't leave. Don't 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 don't, don't give leave room one and then for uh, that will probably yes, even be let it cut across. Don't give room for okay. So it's so yes, we should not uh, bring in yes. injustice and whatsoever because everybody will now start claiming special yes. status now. All right, good. I like that because we know we know ourselves in Nigeria. We know we would abuse such um, opportunities. Now, but yes. this rule of 16 yeah. years, many private universities in Nigeria seem not to follow this standard. Is this not injustice on the applicants of public universities? Because we, I know of many, you know, children that are underage and they go to private universities and they are granted admission. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll take that this way. First. First thing first. Okay. This university is in question all of them it should be brought to book but this cannot happen in nigeria and on a second thought again we should start from the basic basic classes okay it should, should be mandated the basic your classes. should not be allowed into primary school okay yes okay. the child that wants to enter secondary school anyone below 10 should not be allowed so okay. if we take it from there mm. If the first one doesn't work, if we take it to that angle, mm -hmm. and there's uh, a kind of uh, cooperation among the three stages of uh, school in the primary, the secondary, and the university, we won't have uh, issues. It okay. will just go seamless. Okay. And everyone will be in their place. Now, the picture of the private universities that I painted now, whose responsibility is it to enforce this rule? Is it that of JAM or the university's concern? Are they the ones to actually you know, enforce this rule to ensure that the age requirement is respected? The age requirement should be respected by the university, by the parents, by NUC, and by primary yeah. school administrators and secondary school administrators, just like I said before. So everybody is involved. No one is left out. All right. It is my duty. It is your duty. It is everybody's duty. All right, good. So let's take a breather. We'll take a, all right, good. So let's take a breather. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back. Please stay with us. All right, you are still listening to Education Today on Light Radio, and we are discussing age requirement for university admission. And we have uh, Mrs. Anika Oduson, a lecturer in the Department of Adult Education, University of Lagos, uh, you know, taking us through. Don't forget, you can be part of this discourse by sending your comments and questions via and contributions to us via www.facebook.com forward slash lights radio our twitter handle is at the lights radio instagram lights underscore radio and youtube light space radio you can also call or send a message to us via sms on whatsapp on 0809 a reminder of our short quiz in what year the chief akintola williams become a chartered accountant send your answer to the whatsapp number 0809 or our facebook or youtube page the first correct answer 
uh, wins uh, the prize. Uh, let me recognize um, Mary Ivy Daniels, uh, who had joined us, um, you know, online. It says, well done, sir. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you very much. So, uh, for others, let us, you know, send in our comments uh, to that, uh, you know, page. So, now we continue with uh, this discussion as we round off. Uh, I have just uh, quite a few questions, just about three of them to go. So, uh, Ms. Odusoya, um, for students who finish secondary school before age 16, in minus in your own case, now what would you recommend? What should they be doing while waiting uh, so that it won't look like we are wasting their time and we're also allowing their intellect to waste away? So what would you recommend that we do for such people? Because I know the short course some other parents do okay. is to actually enroll them for A levels so that they will gain direct entry admission to 200 level. So one way or the other, they are still maintaining. By the time they are 16 years, they are not coming to 200 level. Can you imagine how, that kind of fast game? So, but what would you recommend that um, you know <laughs> people should do, you know, during this waiting period? Uh, well, during this waiting period, uh, there are enormous things that can be done. So even if we start now, if I start counting, we will leave here. We have a computer appreciation that a student can go for within that period. Okay. Uh, okay. Can, the, the student can be an IT guru within that one year, not uh, like, like uh, fully, but in some way, he can pick up something from okay. that IT uh, aspect okay. during that waiting period. Okay. okay. Uh, we also have uh, skill acquisitions here and there. Okay. okay. If a boy, such boy can decide to go into uh, shoemaking, Corporate, okay. corporate shoemaking, and a host of other things. Okay. There are so many to mention. Okay. There are so, so many to mention. Mm. But we tend to neglect all these things. We say, oh, no, there's, there's no cash spare. I tell you. <laughs> lots, right. uh, lots I, I, and I agree and I appreciate that comment because I know quite well that it, there are lots of things that people can do. Even for those probably that have yeah. you know, interest in languages, they can do that. There are some other professional courses yeah. that some of these students can actually engage in. I know for it, probably someone that probably is in the business that you can actually do your ICANN, you can you know register for CIPM, yeah. you can register for so many of these institutes that you have out there. You know, for those in probably engineering and science, you can go for programming languages and so many other things that could actually even yes. aid your program by the time you eventually gain admission to the university. Thank you for very much for that. Now, um, yeah. now I okay. want to ask this because it relates to what you said that we probably should, we should even go lower. Now, I have this question that many students finish early um, because, especially at secondary school, because they started earlier than usual. At nine, many students are now in just as one. And most parents and schools now avoid basic six because they actually don't even allow them to spend, uh, you, know, uh, you know, to enroll for basic six from uh, basic five straight to just as one. Now, so is it not necessary at this point to probably remove this age barrier or should we just continue with this point? Because I know that since for a lot of schools, especially private schools, that is no basic six. So, should we still maintain these 16 years? Or probably it's time for us to actually change? Because at least it was at some point that we came up with this rule. Can't we change because of the realities of now? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, my answer to that question is a policy has been made. It has been deliberated upon. So, but it is open to review. Is it through... not open to review? in you know it's because of the it. realities of modern times okay you know, because i'm trying to speak yeah, on about behalf, the reality yeah the realities of modern time that we have these children finishing at 14 15. so why delay them earlier uh, you know further or probably because you know some of this you, see, you know some of these children will feel can't. like see let me tell you sorry let me speak uh, the language of this why are these old cargoes actually di dictating for our lives now it's about our lives. It's not about them now. So they are going to their grace. So why are they disturbing our lives? Now imagine that mentality or that feeling. So what would you say or how do you respond to it that it's probably the old people that are actually pegging, you know, their lives and their future. And probably they feel like you guys are toying with our future with all these, um, you know, barriers that you're setting. Like, is it not is it, isn't it high time that we probably ended, you know, this kind of um, idea? No. In fact, it's a good time for us to oppose this idea. Wow. Because we have a lot of vices <laughs> oh. going 
on in the tertiary here situations. and there mm. as a result of not yes as a result of uh, parents not adhering to this policy mm. we have students graduating with uh less than a 2.0 cgpa wow course, what's that for and at the end of the day if we look through the records of the students we see that they are underage students most mm. of them are underage they are not yet mature to you to know, face the rigor of the university education wow. the few with a chance play the few is like the usual secondary school it's only when you have exams that's when you read your book the mm. university goes beyond that now on the flip side of this coin don't you think even university Maybe. management social media a lot mm. of things a lot of vices mm. on the flip side uh, Ms. Odisson, please let's look at this because i'm trying to you just mentioned it now yeah these students are under it a lot of them now, on the flip side, don't you think yes. university management enjoy having these underage pupils? Because they are the ones that, you know, you actually prescribe them from actually having a union. And they feel like so these are kids, now these are babies. So, we cannot engage this one. And that's probably, you see, the reason why so a lot of student union, um, you know, government in SUGs in many of these tertiary institutions, they are already dead. Because these underage students that actually, you know, fill these, you know, um, you know, institutions and the university management or even this such an institution management enjoy having this because just give them order. If we have increased school fees, go and pay, go and do this. no union, nothing, nothing. And we are, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, pupils, because they are very, very young compared to that, those times when you have, you know, very mature people that could easily confront them with ideas intellectually and engage with the authority and say, you cannot just be bossing us around with this. We really need to probably negotiate before we can agree on anything. So don't you think the universities or some of these social institutions managers are also profiting from having these underage pupils in the universities? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the, uh, the university uh, management, as you say, um, they are on their own. Okay. And then this set of students are on their own. Mm. Now, let's look at it this way. For what reason was the university set up for the students? Mm. Am the I right? Learning, for yeah. the students. Yeah. Now, the management is just there to guide these students, to yes, lead them. Absolutely. So we have put these laws in place that this is the best for the students. Okay. So if you are not saying, okay, it will, uh, for what will benefit the management? Is it about the benefits of the management or the benefits of the students? Okay, okay, okay. All That's right. one. Then secondly, if I, if I give you the statistics of my departments, the, the best students in my department are those that are of age. Wow. The best students in my department. The ones that are very low grades, they are the babies. They are not, <laughs> they are not ready. They are not the ready, readiness actually. is not there. The they are not ready. Like, they are not ready for studies. Actually. The readiness is just zero. It's just like they are pushed. They were pushed. They were forced to come yes. to school. Yes. And they see coming to school as a favor and to their parents. How long are we going to continue? Mm. Yes. That's exactly what it is. Mm. So if they see that they have come of age, oh, I'm growing. I've got to 16. Very soon I'm going to be 17, 18. Mm. They, they tend to wake up and say, oh, I need to face life. I think I need to wake up. Mm. But that time is too late. You understand? All right. Good. So no. by then, I mean. Mm. Okay. So it's not about the management. It's Let's leave the management out okay. of it. All right. The no students, problem. everything boils down to the students. All right. On a final note, so what advice do you have for students, for parents, for some of these secondary schools and primary schools and university management concerning this policy? On a final note, so what advice do you have for everybody? Oh, for everybody, please. Let us embrace this policy. It's the best thing that can ever happen to us. Let's embrace it. Let's uphold our own. This is our policy. Mm. It's the best. Maturity because many required. times, whatever is good is always hard to, to adhere to. But in the end, I'm sure all of us will smile. Mm. Yes, we will smile. Just like I'm smiling for most of my students now that came in at the right time. I smile, but when I see them, I'm happy. Because I'm they happy. understand what they are let in this for. Let happiness let it radiate in all of us. Mm. Yeah. So please let's embrace this policy for for the for the good of the country, for the good of the families, for the good of the students themselves, mm, mm. so that it can be useful for themselves. Sincerely, would like to appreciate you, and it's a very very good note to end our discuss. It's all about us. It's about our future. So let us not jeopardize it just because we want to rush in. Where exactly are we rushing to? Are we rushing to our graves? So, thank you very much. So, that's all we can take on this segment for today. We'd like to appreciate our guest, Ms. Cesar Nikel Dusoya of the Department of Adult Education, Faculty of Education, University of Lagos, for coming on the show today. Uh, we hope to have more opportunities to speak with you on other issues concerning uh, you know, education in the future. I hope you are giving us your word. 
Yeah, so <laughs> well, thank, <laughs> thank you, you very much. It's been a thank nice time with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very yeah, much. We so appreciate it. All right, yeah, so we'll go on you. another break. We'll be back with the words on the marble. Please stay with us. <laughs> All right, you're welcome to the What's on the Marble segment on education. Today, we'll take a look at memorable quotes that are educational and inspirational to everyone. Today, we have a quote from Samuel Allman. According to him, maturity is the ability to think, speak, and act your feelings within the bounds of dignity. Again, maturity is the ability to think, speak, and act your feelings within the bounds of dignity. That's our words on the marble for today. We must accept the fact that maturity and readiness are prerequisites for learning. It is important to allow our children to mature physically and mentally before releasing them into higher education institutions where they are meant to think and act by themselves and for which they would be held accountable. Let us not rush them into mistakes and regrettable errors. A word is enough for the wise. All right. Good. So, uh, for our quiz uh, question, we said that... Um, so, in what year did Chief Akintola Williams become a chartered accountant? All right. Um, do we have anyone on WhatsApp? Do we have any? All right. None. None. Okay, good. Um, and on Facebook, I cannot see any here right now. All right, but the answer to that question actually is uh, that Chief Akintola Williams became a chartered accountant in 1949, becoming the first Nigeria to do so. All right. So uh, we recognize and appreciate uh, Chief Akintola Williams for his service to the accounting profession, to Nigeria, to Nigeria as a whole, and for the whole of humanity. All right, so this is just to inform you, ISM listeners, that you can advertise your products and services and also showcase your events on our program. This you can do by calling the number 070 I'll take that again. 70 Thank you very much for joining us today. Let us know how you feel about today's program through our various platforms at www.facebook.com forward slash education today. Twitter handle at education today. Instagram education underscore today. Figure two, then D-A-Y education underscore two. Figure two, D-A-Y education today. Uh, YouTube education space today. You can also send an email to education media services at gmail.com. You can also watch the video of today's broadcast. Uh, again, on Facebook or YouTube via Light Radio, please like our pages and share our videos to others. You can also listen to the repeat broadcast of the episode on Radio Garden app on Wednesday between 2 and 3 p.m. West African time. And thanks to the entire crew of Education Today and the managers of Light Radio, including MC Vibes, TYS, and Fishire. Uh, my supervising producer today had been Nima Ibrahim. Do join us same time, same station next week. I am Olubu Mikazim. See you then. Goodbye. <laughs>